right, welcome, welcome, welcome back to the podcast. I'm here with AJ, AJ and I'm Johnny. And today, AJ and I had stumbled upon an interesting article a friend had sent me, and it was called Brutal Truths. And it got us talking, and we had a lot of fun talking about what would be brutal truths that we had learned through our lives. So we figured we would discuss it with you guys today. And after the mental models and frameworks episode, we got a lot of outpouring from fans asking us for some recommended reading resources on that subject. And we linked a few in the podcast notes for that episode on mental models and frameworks. And out of that, we started thinking about what are some brutal truths that we've learned along the way that have had a huge impact on our life. And I think really the first one here is one of those ones that for most people is a little shocking, especially in today's social media world yeah. where we feel like everyone cares about us, but in reality, nobody cares. Yes, number one, nobody cares. And uh, that's a hard one to learn. It's, it's almost once you figure that out, it can, it can be, it could, it could be upsetting. It could be it's depressing. It's depressing, yeah, to think that here you're doing all these things because you want other people's attention, approval, and acceptance, as we talked about in value. And to realize that, guess what? Everyone else is also operating in that same mode, so they're only concerned with what's in front of their own nose and their own perspective, not yours. I guess a lot of this has to do with that, that thought experiment of building a movie around yourself, right? And then all the other characters that are in your movie are secondary characters. And even your friends, they're like comedy relief. They're the other people in the movie. But they have, they're have they filming their, their own movies. Absolutely. And so they can't really be concerned what's going on with your plot and what's going on in your story because they have their own story to continue to create. And you're lucky to have them to at least come through, be a part of right. it, hang out with you. But they got to go on. They're going to make their movie as well. And when it comes down to our own personal suffering, right? Sometimes it's hard for us to realize that other people are suffering too. Other people's problems outweigh your problems. It may be difficult for you to hear because the suffering is immediate and in the moment for you, but people don't care about your suffering. People don't want to hear you whining and complaining about your first world problems. The, the interesting thing about this list is... I think a lot of these up front will sound upsetting, will sound depressing. However, if you embrace these, like number one here, if you embrace the idea that no one cares, well, now all of a sudden it's not, it's, we've moved beyond depressing. It's now freeing. Right. It's liberating. We don't have to worry about other people's opinions and views because we could just assume they don't care. <laughs> they don't care. If they don't care, yeah. then why are we paying any attention to what they're saying or talking about us or doing on social media, etc.? The other point here is pain is not special to you. Nope. And no matter if the pain is subtle or great, everyone feels pain the same. So their perspective of the pain that they're suffering is going to always be greater than yours. Mm-hmm. So trying to out pain, out suffer, out victim someone else is a losing battle. Well, it's always a losing battle, and I th- I think there is something in a, in men's DNA that when you're when you're growing older, one of the first sort of ways you learn to roll through the neighborhood as a young kid is the bigger and badder, right? If, if let's just say though, okay, well I can out muscle my neighbor. So then I can out muscle this guy and I'm, I'm, I'm faster on my bike than this kid. And now you're in, so you have a couple block radius where you're the king. Right. And maybe then you roll into the next neighborhood and there's another kid who's a little bit bigger, a little bit badder. And you're like, ah, and then of course you roll to another neighborhood. Cause as you're getting a little bit older, you're venturing farther out and you learn, well, there's another kid in this other neighborhood. Yeah, king of that block. A king of that block. And all of a sudden, you are you realize that there's always somebody bigger. There's always somebody badder. There's always somebody faster. There's always somebody smarter. So it's a it's about being able to create your your own your own thing going on and allowing those people to do theirs, but finding your own special niche. Well, I know we talked a lot about our upbringing and our dads. Yeah. And... It's funny because our dads had that same view of stop your whining. Oh. Could you imagine growing up whining around dad about something that happened in school or in sports? Well, I'm not sure if I, I, I mentioned it on that podcast, but 
for my for myself, if I was to whine about anything, usually the first thing out of my dad's mouth was, "Listen, if you want to talk like that, talk like that around your mother." I, I just spent ten hours bending glass in a furnace of a factory. I don't, I don't want to hear it. Right? What, what the kid down the street made fun of you? Buck up! <laughs> buck up! That's not only is that going to continue to happen. That's going to ha- that's going to happen the rest of your life. And, and what happened? We put out a podcast. People made fun of our hair. Oh. People are always going to be making fun of you. If you live your life worried about what other people think and ready to whine because they don't like you, well, you're going to have a really rough time. I think one of the fun experiments that you can do is just just roll around through social media and go to some of your your heroes pages or their YouTube or whatever, and you will see people talking shit on your hero, on your... Uh, your crush, uh, yeah. anyone that you look up to, there's some flaw, something wrong that someone wants to bash them for. It's a part of the game. It's a part of being alive and in the world. So understanding that nobody cares, so stop your whining and complaining. <laughs> you're not winning anyone over to your side. You're not convincing people that your problem is bigger or greater than theirs, and they should pay more attention to you than their own issues. The victim Olympics. The victim Olympics. <laughs> no gold medals. Everyone loses in the victim Olympics. The second one is do not waste your talent. And I think that one is a little surprising in that a lot of us don't realize that talent is something that not very many people have in these areas. So if you can find your talent, the one thing that you're good at, Celebrate that, own that, even if it's not accepted by others, even if that talent is Street Fighter, Mm -hmm. right? We had an alumni come through the program, world champion in Street Fighter, and he owned it, right? Most people be like, I don't want to talk about being good in video games. I don't want to talk about loving comic books. I don't want to talk about how much I obsess over anime. Well, I I, I want to dive into that story a little bit because I'm sure a lot of people listening to this can identify with that. So... Having this this talent in this video game was his thing. And because he loved this game so much, he was always afraid to open his mouth and share about himself because what if it slips out? What if somebody hears finds about out. It, finds out about this and he's going to get crucified? And so he was extremely shy and ex- ex- stayed very reserved in any of that. And... It was, you know, through his program was about a few days in and for myself and AJ, we we tend to bust everyone's balls up up front in the program, just trying to get everyone to loosen up and to relax a bit. And he was being extremely reserved, very tight. And I remember it was about three quarters in and we were doing a at this time we were doing a storytelling portion of class and I could tell he was getting a little nervous because the whole point of it was to talk about something that he cared about. And he went up, gave some bullshit story. He didn't put any emotion into it. And I remember the rest of the guys and myself were getting a little bit fed up because he wasn't putting out. And and he gave some bullshit story. He's like, well, that's it. And went to sit down. And and the guys were all looking at him like, that's not it. "Uh, That's not good enough. We're all we're all giving here and we're all putting it out there and you're going to have to, and I told him like, you're going to give us something. You're going to give us something now and you get back up there until, and you're going to stay up there until, until this we get happens. It. Yeah. And I remember him looked at looking down and looking basically defeated. Like he was in a corner and he had nowhere to go. And if he was to get out of this, he's going to have to give us the story. So he's a, he just says, fine, fine. You guys want a story? I'll give you a story. <laughs> So he goes on to talk about being that this, I can't remember the event. Uh, Eva was the event and it's in Vegas and he's competing in street fighter and it's all the street fighter top players from around the world from around the world are here at this event. And it just turned out. And of course, my question is how do you even get involved in this? Because I'm not a gamer. I wouldn't even know. And especially such a niche nineties video game, but he had been a foreign exchange student in Japan and that was a huge ordeal and it was a big subculture and and so he had grown up uh competing in this so he's at evo well there's one other thing yeah one little detail that i love about the story 
and he finally got vulnerable enough to admit it. Yeah. He chose his college, his undergraduate college, yeah. based on the fact that the arcade in town had the version of Street Fighter that he was best at. There you go. That's how much that level of dedication to Street Fighter we're talking about. Now this is a that is a love and a, and a just yeah all about it. And so he's telling his story. He's competing in it, and it it's a, it's like a Rocky versus Drago type story <laughs> because he is the only white cat at, at, at this this game a convention right all the top players in the world are Japanese. asian yeah and he's this and he's a little bit on the taller side oh yeah so he, he out. stands out he stands out <laughs> and so of course everyone is booing him and he just starts kicking ass and he is mowing people over and he's going through the ranks and slowly Gaining the adora- the adulation of respect. the crowd and the respect of these of the, of the other players, and now he finds himself fighting for the championship uh, for that year, and he has half the crowd on his side, and they are fighting it out, and he gets the guy to like a sliver of a life, and the guy had pulls out this move that's like I don't know one in a thousand combinations that he pulled out and just. He gets obliterated in that final nanosecond where he could have won. And he is now celebrated because of where he'd taken the champion to, to the, his limits, and and was widely accepted into this culture that, that he looked up upon and wanted to be a part of. And it was in that moment that he looked around the room and saw that all of us were sitting at the edge of the, the our couches think, going, yeah. Finally. And, and and then what happened? Like, we're so engrossed that he realizes for the first time that this thing that he's been hiding his whole entire life w- was something that actually is quite, because he shared his passion for, we all now have taken notice and now are, are interested. And we want to know more. And this thing that he has felt so reserved about him, so scared of it, if it ever would come out, is now sharing it is now being accepted. And so for the rest of the program, we couldn't get him to shut up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's now free of this thing that he's been and that's so scared about. We often let other people's criticism of us hold us back yeah. and shy away from our talents, the things that we are good at. And guess what? Talent is fleeting. Talent is hard to find. If you are talented at something, don't let a stranger, a friend, an acquaintance, a relative's thoughts or feelings hinder you from throwing yourself at that. And I would argue one of the biggest regrets that you can have in life is not scratching that itch, not trying to take yourself to your limits of your talents. Well, how many guys have we seen who come through who realized that they have given up something that they love so much only to put their career on hold for a while to dive into it. I'm thinking specifically of one of our guys who, who's from Iceland who always wanted to be an actor. And, yep. and, and to add to that, our buddy Justin, who's always wanted to give comedy a 100% try. And so people giving up their careers to realize, I need to scratch this itch because if I get any older and realize that I haven't given it a shot... I'm going to be upset with myself. And I personally know from my own experiences of leaving home and going to North Carolina and giving music my all and being able to entrench myself and be on the road and give it 100% allowed me to experience other things. I couldn't even imagine what life would be about if I didn't have that opportunity to, to go all in. And that's it. If you do not go all in, That is the life of regret Yes, that we want to avoid. Obviously, no one wants to be on their deathbed saying, oh, I wish I had explored that. I wish I had taken that a little bit further. Yeah, And we've had countless instances of that in our lives. I know science for me, music for you, and then you could argue the art of charm. Oh, People criticizing, having something to say about what we're trying to do, what we're about, family members, friends doubting us. I could easily paint that picture. I mean, you had called and said, hey, Listen, uh, we'd like to do this. Are you interested in moving to New York and creating this company? And I, and I remember thinking, well, let me see. Two guys that I don't know want me to move to a city I never lived in before. We're going to start a company. We don't even know what it's going to be. I'm in. I'm in. And, I, and the reason being was I was like, I know that these sorts of opportunities don't present themselves every day. And 
for myself, I always believed that luck was having opportunities, but being brave enough to take them. And I, there was no way I wanted to look back and go, what if? What ifs are the worst? And if you look at any sort of data of people who are on their deathbed, it's always about the, the they That's regret the, the, the what thought. ifs. It's families and what ifs. And this truth reminds me of the show America's Got Talent. Yeah. You watch that show and you see just such a wide array. And I, they have it in every country. It's not just America. Not to <laughs> put AOC America first. <laughs> but the idea that, listen, if your talent is riding a unicycle and juggling, have at it. Give it your all. Don't let that drop to the wayside because of other people's thoughts and feelings and criticisms because the critics will be out there no matter, no matter what. what. You are not going to please everyone. The third truth we have here on our wonderful list, stay responsible. What do we mean by that, Johnny? Well, I think the minute responsibility, the word pops up, a lot of people have a lot of very surface level ideas of what that means. Like, oh, I wake up on time. I get to work on time. I made my bed this morning. And sure, that's being responsible. But there's a, there's a lot of deeper meaning to it when it comes to your actions, your cognitive processes, your emotions, your emotions, thoughts, everything else, all compacted, the entirety of you, you're able to take responsibility for. Well, I think when we hear responsibility, we think adult-like things, right? Yeah. Oh, I'm an adult. I have a job. I have my own place. I got my own car. My parents aren't paying my phone bill. I'm responsible. I'm responsible. But these same people are the ones who indulge, have no self-control, don't have habits, aren't working on their discipline and willpower. Mm -hmm. So responsibility is taking ownership of your life. And that involves not only your successes, but your failures. Stop pushing the responsibility on other people. Stop making excuses and blaming others for your lot in life. I, I keep seeing this reoccurring theme on social media where people talk about adulting. Yeah. And I cannot stand the term. Oh, I have, to, I have to be an adult today. The reason that your life is a complete disaster and you're unhappy with every aspect of it is because you think responsibility is adulting. It's, you think it's selling out. When in fact, taking responsibility gives you free time. It allows you to put processes together. It allows you to see victories and, and help in your progress and anything that you're doing. I mean, these are all things that allow you to know you're moving in the right direction towards everyone's goal, which is to be happy, to and enjoy their day. To your point, responsibility is movement. Right? Yes. When you refuse to take responsibility, you've stalled. You're not moving. You're not growing. You're letting things fester mm -hmm. and you're letting other people dictate your results and your lot in life, which is not where you want to be. That's not a winning hand. I remember <clears throat> getting into self development and learning about some new ways for myself to be able to take responsibility and how just getting up at a certain time at a regular time or working out like how it just changes everything. And it's like, well, okay. If I took, I took responsibility over these couple things in my life has completely changed. What if I just take responsibility over every aspect? And this is why people, I, why I love listening to Jocko Willink. I mean, his whole thing about discipline equals freedom. And I can't argue with that. In fact, the more responsibility I take in every aspect, the, the better my life becomes. I got to say, you're getting up earlier, Johnny. <laughs> you're, you're dressing nicer. I, I like the new responsible Johnny. The new responsible Johnny. Thumbs up from AJ. <laughs> Number four, death is final. And for a lot of us, myself included, you know, this truth comes up through loss. Mm -hmm. You know, I lost my dad and that really put this concept to the forefront for me. Do you have unfinished business? Are you leaving something on the table? Are you not following through? You only get one life. You only get one opportunity at this. I, I know we might have some Buddhists and religious people disagreeing with me and listening to this, but if you act as if you have multiple lives and if you act as if it doesn't matter in this one, then you're gonna end up with subpar results. So taking ownership of your actions, that responsibility also leads to you realizing that I only have this opportunity in front of me. 
And am I going to sit there and complain about what's given to me, or am I going to do the best with what I have? Mm -hmm. I remember making a choice, and I think this is one of those things that, that allowed me to embrace the idea of self-development was the idea that life is there's a finite amount of time and i can spend it in any way i want why wouldn't i want to spend it being the best that i could possibly be like i that i couldn't rationalize any other way of of living my life so then it's like okay well once i made that commitment it's i want to educate myself i want to get uh, i want to learn about responsibility i want to take on all these things i want to learn things. I want to put myself in a position to, to fail so I can get better at things. It just changes the whole idea. Well, we were talking to John, our show producer about some coach he's getting from Jesse Itzler. And the, the interesting thing about what John was saying earlier is when you start to quantify how many opportunities you're going to have at something in your life, right? Yes. You realize that death is final. Mm -hmm. You don't get more opportunities. Then you start to take a step back and think about, well, how many summers will I have? How yeah. many opportunities will I have to spend with my dad? How many times will I be able to go to a baseball game, right? When you start to realize that there's a lot fewer of those opportunities than you think. And they become fewer every day. Exactly. It's not infinite. It doesn't stretch on forever. When you realize that there is a finality to your life, are you doing the most to maximize those opportunities? And sometimes... We get so sucked up into technology and social media that we forget about our relationships. We forget about our friends. We forget about those intimate moments that are fleeting. Mm -hmm. And obviously, social media technology is working against us. It's fighting for our attention. It's trying to suck us away from our friends and family. And we've talked about it in the value episodes. They have the most brilliant, incredible people working on getting more of that attention by... Uh, by the hundreds, and and they're and they're doing an, a hell of a job. Very successful. <laughs> I mean, it's an arms race for our attention. I, I, brilliant. It's an arms race for our attention. Absolutely. And with that, right? So celebrating the time you have with loved ones, and thinking about that digital detox, right? Are you turning off your phone? Are you creating space for the people in your life that matter, or are you attached to it? And I know we fall victim to this all the time. Yeah, well, we just had the Miami Mastermind, and <clears throat> you had made mention that you wanted to give the guys, uh, make sure that you were present for more of this than getting sucked into whatever dumb things on Facebook. And I was like, yes, that sounds like a wonderful idea. And it was funny, when I finally got back home, I realized how much dumb stuff that I missed, and then I was like, "Is does any of this stuff matter? Right. Right, like one of the major things that popped up in my feed over the weekend was Danielle Brigoli, Little Tay, and Woe Vicky got an altercation. This is like top trending Facebooks. Do I? Who? Does, is my, you lost me. Exactly. And, and, and I'm ashamed that I even know this. Does my life get any better by knowing this? Or does it get, in, or does it get worse by knowing this? And I can tell you that just knowing that, Made me worse. So did you unfollow TMZ on social media? Uh, absolutely. In fact, it's just it's just another reason why and why I need to do less and less social media. And I'm doing and I think I feel good about making steps closer to less social media every day. Yeah, I, I don't remember where I heard the quote, but I was definitely laughing. It's like our brain was not equipped to handle what a beautiful Australian girl is having for lunch right now. Yeah. I don't need to know what's in her to. grain bowl. I don't need to know how great her life is in Australia. I need to be present in my own, and I need to be enjoying these minutes and moments that I have. Another thing about that, I, I was just listening to, to Sam Harris on Joe Rogan uh, this week. He was on with Majid Nawaz. And what did Sam do? Oh, he, Sam torpedoed his family vacation because he had gotten upset over an Someone lobbing something on Twitter. On Twitter. Now, and here's the thing. If Sam Harris can get distracted and and caught up and torpedo his family vacation over this, right? Sam somebody, meditates. Some, Sam's mindful. Sam gets it. Somebody who I <laughs> look up to. Look yeah. up to and just. Revere. If he can get. So, then what chance do I have? So it's just like I'm done. Well, with we it. don't have a chance no. with technology. It is consuming us. 
the only option we have, and that's exactly what we did to your point in Miami. Yeah. We collected everyone's cell phones. And you know what? And I, and I enjoyed that that weekend so much more. And 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 I can look back on it and 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 just understand the the happiness of without it. And it's certainly not adding anything. And what am I going to get? We're going to have a conversation because I saw that Danielle Br- Brigoli got into <laughs> it with me. Little Tay. We're, we're done. That it's conversation's not, It's done. not adding to anything. <laughs> <laughs> Number five, embrace your emotions. This one can be difficult, too, when we start thinking yeah. about how much our emotions come and go in waves and how strong they could feel in the moment. And sometimes, especially as men, right, we go the opposite direction. We're not embracing anything. We're not embracing our emotions. We're running from our emotions. And I think the one in particular that obviously we harp a lot on is fear. Embracing that emotion instead of running from it, instead of allowing it to dictate your life, owning it, and looking for those moments to push back on that fear. Is this really real? Is this a true fear? Or is this just something that my mind is doing to play a little trick on me, to screw around with me. Well, I, one of the things that I think makes life so much better as I've gotten older, and for us doing this for this company for 11 years, um, had we been people who ran from fear, we certainly wouldn't be in the position that we were in. And it, it takes a while to be able to embrace it. But until you're able to fully embrace it, I think challenging yourself with it and having some fun with it can go a long way in getting you to the point where you can embrace it. Yeah. and I, I, Flirting with it, so to I speak. I mean, fear comes in, in various ways. Yeah. I was invited, uh, it was about six or seven months ago now. I've been working on my golf game. I was invited by a buddy to go play around at a country club. It's my first time playing in a country club. So I was all in my head, all nervous. Yeah. And I was... Afraid that I was going to be the worst one (laughs) out of the group. And sure enough, on the front nine, I was awful. I was second-guessing everything. I was freaking out about how this was going to play. Balls are going left and right. I think I hit the freeway. Got to the turn and just said for a second, why am I so fearful of the next result? Right? Why am I so concerned about what the next thing is? Let me just focus on the shot that I'm on. And I started to calm down a little bit. And I think fear, you know, when people hear fear, they hear like fear of heights, fear mm-hmm. of this, fear of that. But there are small fears that creep up every day that we don't embrace, that we yes. run from. I don't even think they're, they're conscious of them. Right. And understanding that these are the moments that the growth happens, that the real you shines through. Your ability to handle the fear, to face the fear, not you running from the fear. You know, it- I think that also goes back to the last podcast we did where a lot of people who are procrastinators like to wrap it up in that I'm a perfectionist. Yeah. Right. Because they don't want to have to deal with it. Or what we see a lot of the people who bury themselves in work who say I'm a workaholic because they're afraid to go out and socialize. It's not that they're workaholics. They probably go. They, these are also people who say that they're working, who are on social media, just surfing the net i'm working (laughs) yeah when you're worried about everyone's vanity metrics and likes and everything else it's easy to become a workaholic yeah i think the the second point we're we're looking to make here with with these emotions is that we're flawed and these emotions are chemical reactions Mm -hmm. okay these emotions do not define you they are not making or breaking you and they come in waves We've been happy. We've been sad. Yep. Sometimes for no explanation at all. Well, and I think there, there's a book called The Happiness Trap. And, and I think the culture that we grow up in, it, everyone's so focused on having these perfect lives and, and being happy all the time. And that's the goal. That's just not reality. And with, without that having flows, you'd be a robot. You'd be programmed. <clears throat> but to your point... What's happening, right? The walls are closing in on us. We go on social media and everyone we see is happy, frolicking in the sun, living their best life, climbing on a private jet, shooting off somewhere in the world, making millions of dollars, driving fancy cars. So I can't possibly fail. I can't possibly show that I'm flawed or that things are not working out for me. Well, that's when you have any other emotion than what you 
that seems that everyone else is, if everyone else is happy and I'm the one who's not feeling it, well then obviously I must be broken. And then you start going down this road where it's a circle because now you're going to beat my, I'm going to beat myself up because I'm feeling this way. And it just, it's a continuous. And that, that trap leads you into depression. How can it, right? It's a one way street into depression and the comparing that goes along with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I remember when Amy and I first started dating and she and her friends were checking out my Instagram. Yeah. And she came out to visit LA and, and she made a comment like, what is up with your Instagram? And I was like, what do you mean? I don't know. I just take photos that yeah. I like and things I'm going on and it just, you know, whatever hops to mind. And she's like, you're not presenting yourself right. Why would you take a photo of these French fries? This doesn't look just like, and it was like the first time in my life that I realized Oh, I'm supposed to be presenting the best version of myself on social media to everyone. I'm not supposed to just in the moment be like, oh, this was cool. Oh, this was funny. Well, oh, look at this thing I saw on the street in Barcelona. I also, part of that's generational. It is. Of, uh, how for myself, Gen X views social media compared to how a millennial uses it compared to what Generation Z is going to do with it, which supposedly they're supposed to be checking out of it. Yeah, I, I think they're not using the apps at all. Yeah. Which, in my mind, is the direction that I'd rather go. Yeah. And we often talk that one of the main reasons we're on Facebook in general is to interact with the alumni of the program yes. and to be part of that private Facebook group that everyone is accessing. And outside of that, I have news, news, I have news feed eradicator. I try not to engage in it. And I realize that I'm missing a few people's birthdays. I'm missing out on a few celebrations online. I'm also missing out on a lot of complaining about Trump this and so and so that and this person screwing me and oh apparently I missed out on some pseudo celebrities getting into a, an argument over the weekend. Yeah, I could tell you all about that. <laughs> the crazy thing about this, and this is sort of the the uh, one of the aha moments that happens during boot camp for our guys, is when you start to embrace and own your emotions, the good and the bad you start to open up this vulnerability that lets connection happen. Yes. When you start speaking about your emotions, listening to other people's emotions, embracing emotions and not running from emotions, that window that you open up to other people allows for that connection to happen. And a lot of times we get caught up in, oh, well, you know, let's connect on commonalities, common interests, right? That, that can happen. And it's a trap because a lot of us, high connection to commonalities and common interests. Yep. The reason that connection's happening is the emotion that that commonality evokes. You are sharing that emotion with you. If you take a step back and realize that it's not the commonality, it's the universal of the emotions, then I can relate to Johnny when he's been happy on stage. Of course. Just like the moment of happiness I felt shooting my best round of golf, breaking 90. I wasn't on stage. I don't play guitar, but that moment of elation, that moment of celebration and victory, that's what we can relate on. And the anything of a been through life, you've experienced the full range of emotions, so there is no reason that you're unable to at least give an attempt to connect with other people. The other side of that is just because you have now embraced your emotions doesn't mean that everyone else has. has. Right. So it takes you being patient. I think the most important thing here is to understand that we're human beings and we're going to feel the full range of emotions. And if, if, if you're not feeling great, that's okay. And also to understand, okay, maybe I don't feel so good. Okay, well, what can I do to maybe fix this? Or what can I do tomorrow to at least help me feel a little bit better? And emotions are fleeting. Mm -hmm. Days can go by and you won't remember the anger that you had at TMZ for giving you such bad news about your heroes. <laughs> you won't remember the conflict months from now, years from now. But in the moment, I get it. Emotionally, it's charged. You feel it. And sometimes it can be difficult to wrap your head around those things. Yes. Number six in our brutal truth list, you can't make everyone your friend. And this is a realization that I think... I started to have late 20s. Yeah. I, I really did want everyone to be my friend. And it, a lot of the people pleasing came from my dad. And 
the behaviors that I picked up from him growing up. And really when we put ourselves out there and the platform that we have grew and we started getting really unfiltered negative feedback, yeah, you start to realize that, wow, I thought I had a great impression. I thought, oh, yeah. I thought that guy loved me. And you get the <laughs> feedback, he's like, AJ's an asshole. <laughs> and then you start going, well, what the heck did I do wrong? I don't, you can't wrap your head around what you did wrong. Having the realization that sometimes you're serving pizza and they're yeah. looking for Chinese food. I think for myself learning this, it was uh, early 20s as well. And I remember... It was, I was performing. It was one of my f first gigs. <clears throat> and there must have been, I don't know, four people who came out to see us that evening. And so it's like, for when that happens, you're like, I want to make all four of these people our biggest fan, right? And so you're giving your, your everything. And you see this person go, meh, and they leave. You see this person like, meh, they shrug your shoulders. It's, <laughs> and you're like, I've given, how is this, Everything. how are you not our biggest fan? I'm giving you the full show. And it's, and, <clears throat> and that's when it was a small crowd. And then I, and I remember getting so frustrated and so angry and then I started beating myself up and then, and of course I wanted to yell at them. Well, you people just don't know good music when you hear it. And you don't know pure it's talent. Their fault, well, yeah, right? it's, their, it's their fault. And I remember somebody older was like, listen, just celebrate the people who are into it, right? Don't play to the crowd. Just do your thing and and find the people who are going to be interested in what you do. Don't try to entertain them. And, of course, once I adopted that, it was, a, allevi it was alleviated all this necessity of having to win over each of these people. Now we're just going to give our best performance and those who are there who, who do like us we're going to get the greatest show ever rather than trying to uh, make each one of these people separately like you because the minute you give them that extra attention, you've alienated the other people. And, and you're trying to win them over. A lot of times, the critics are just the loudest. Of course. The people who are enjoying it, the people who are loving the show, they're just smiling. They're not sitting there with their bullhorn yelling at you, get off stage, what the heck's wrong with you? So it's easy to get caught up in the people that don't like you. It's easy to get caught up in the negative feedback. Mm -hmm. When well, you can have the realization that not everyone's going to like you, you can change that behavior where you're chasing other people's value. You can change that behavior where you're holding back on actions that you care about because you're trying to win everyone over. Sure. Right? When you try to win everyone over, you're not being authentic. You're not being yourself, and people sense that. I always, as a thought experiment, I always ask uh, our clients or, or just anybody, like, what is your thought process that you go through before you post something on social media? And realize how you're looking at different factions of your life and and who will get upset and who won't, who will cheer you on and will this person. And then start to think, okay, I have X number of Facebook friends. Friends, I put that in air quotes. Right? How many of those people, let's just say out of 100, how many of those people you think actually really like you? How, how many of those? I bet you there is a percentage, maybe a small I would think, unless you're a complete asshole. That like you, yeah, I agree with that. That... I mean, <laughs> who just think you're you're a jerk, right? They're like, oh, what's AJ posting today? Oh, well, look at this guy. Yeah. <laughs> there are a contingent of people that love to watch the car crash that are waiting for you to fail. There's a contingent of people that are cheering you on silently. Oh, yeah. That are just enjoying. They're not hitting the like. And one of the things that I uh, found so fascinating about that 60 Minutes piece on social media was this idea that everyone is so concerned about that initial burst of likes and attention mm -hmm. on social media. And I found myself getting caught up in it where yeah. I'll post something and then, you know, I only get four likes. No one's why I just delete it. Right. Just, I don't want it up. And so the software engineers have realized this. And what they do is they actually group together the likes and the comments into these bursts so that you post something and it waits until it hits 10 or 20, the critical number, and then it says, hey, look, 30 people like this. Yeah. So you get an even bigger boost. <laughs> of like, I gotta come back to the app and now see who's liking it. So when you, you start to realize that not only am I chasing the wrong things, I'm chasing yeah. likes, I'm chasing other people's approval on social, you also realize that 
the technology is working against my psyche. It is working against me right now. It is pooling people's likes to get me sucked more in. And all of a sudden, I'm now so concerned with this digital life, this digital representation yeah. of me, that I'm missing real life, what's going on right now in the moment. Well, what's curious to me is, is uh, and we, we've been talking about it, and this has been mentioned in several episodes now. Obviously, with all this new technology, there are some things that are going haywire wrong. And there's also some things that are great, right? We're all right. connected. Information's flowing. Well, yeah, you can uh, find your high school friends and they can complain about how successful you are in yeah, L.A. Fantastic, right? <laughs> but I, I am interested to see how it all shakes out because like... You know, you can equate this to the, the printing press being invented and the hysteria of, well, now everyone's going to get all this information and everyone's going to be not able to... Not everyone can handle it. it. They're and, not uh, equipped. Uh, right. Uh, uh, so it's likened to that. And I am interested to see how... Because uh, it's going to go far over and then retracted and it's and it's going to be a... It's a balancing act. Like with any new technology, it'll be interesting to see how it all shakes out. Because the way we're going right now, and it's, it's, it's a mess. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm really interested to see, and I, I think that there's going to be a tipping point. There may even be these services available already. But instead of the services that remove all the negative stories about you and remove all yeah. of the negative publicity online, services that just delete everything of you online, yeah. make you a ghost go through and remove and scrub the internet of mm -hmm. all those references of all those positive and negative so that people can't search you at all to get back your privacy, right? When you think about, and we're, we're interviewing and hiring right now. So our first thought is go online. Okay. Let's look this person up. Let's figure out what's going on. Sure. And you know, you get to page four or five of Google and you realize, man, they posted this in 2002. I, I'm not even sure they want me to be reading this. Do they even know I can read this? You know, it's like you, you well, start to realize just how flippant we were in the beginning. Oh, this new service, Live Journal. Let me just write all my thoughts and feelings. Yeah. Oh, and, tr and trust me, I've seen some friends' Live Journals that had <laughs> – I'm like, what? oh, what? And I, yeah, it's totally it's, – it's hilarious. And, and I know personally for myself, like when we started this company, I was – I was learning how to to write myself, and then you know you you, you put a, an article together, you think it's okay, and then you're like, okay, well let me publish this on the blog, and you're not ready for that. It's like when <clears throat> we already have a platform. I just wrote something for the first time. I think it's okay, and then to stick it up there, and then you're just getting just destroyed because like, what is this? A third grade wrote it, like. Well, actually, but I'm, I'm learning. I did I'm complete trying, the third grade. I'm trying, I'm trying to do my best here. So that whole idea of you can't make everyone your friend. Obviously, with social media, you can make everyone your friend. Anyone could be your Facebook friend. Anyone could be yep. your Instagram friend. And that's sort of the problem here is we started to blur the line between yes. friends and acquaintances and service connections and real people that have connection and care about us deeply. And a lot of times because of this, we've moved in this direction. Of, I just got to collect more Facebook friends, yeah. right? I just got to get more people following me, more people paying attention to me. How about you get more people invested in your life, invested in your success, invested in you and connected and you invested in their lives? Well, once you get into the attention economy of people paying attention, you just get in the habit of doing more and more outrageous stuff. And I think we know a few guys like that. Yeah. And how <laughs> how far is that going to go before you're so far off the deep end that you you can't even try to be normal? You couldn't even you, it would be well, that impossible. happens all the time with YouTube stars, right? You yeah. look at some of the big ones where they're trying to push the envelope to get the extra views, to get the extra people engaged. And well, it's funny. I was just talking with somebody, and I was it, this was a few months ago when the the Logan Paul yeah stuff went down, <clears throat> and they were laughing. They're like, "Listen, he doesn't even care because all of this is just more publicity." I'm like, "But, but." psyche wise it's it's not good for him he like he's getting more followers he's getting more attention but he has to continually figure out other ways to push this where it just get more and more outrageous um, really what's interesting to me is people like pewdiepie who's already been around the block a few times where he just 
it seems to me, I not a, I don't watch his show, but it, from what I can tell, is he just continually just doing his thing. And if you like him, you like him. If you're not, you're not. He's not going out of his way to find outrageous stuff. He is going, he's trying to be creative and be funny, but he's not filming dead people and I smashing know. rats. And, I, he's had some issues as well. Yeah, well, I think everybody. Maybe we'll, <laughs> maybe we'll table that discussion we'll for be, a future episode. We'll bring him on next time.